Okay, then let's continue from last time. The last time we ended up with uh, the standard model gauge fixing term in RxI gauge. Remember that RxI gauge is a special gauge fixing which is very practical and very often used in concrete calculations at tree level and at higher orders in the electroweak standard model. It is adapted uh, to loop calculations in particular because uh, certain mixing terms which mix Goldstone bosons and gauge bosons which appear otherwise in the Lagrangian are simply cancelled by um, a tricky choice of the gauge fixing where you have basically squares of uh, this gauge fixing function which combines derivatives of gauge bosons with Goldstone bosons and those cancel similar mixing terms from the kinetic terms of the scalar fields. And uh, what just remains to do is to say uh, what we already said in the generic case for a general Young-Mills theory with spontaneous symmetry breaking, namely the gauge fixing term cannot come alone on its own. It must be accompanied by fadiev popov ghost interaction terms because only then the full Lagrangian has a symmetry, BRST symmetry, which guarantees that then the physical S matrix is unitary on the subspace of physical states which have positive norm. And so how can we extend the gauge fixing term to a BRST invariant Lagrangian including fadiev popov ghosts? Very simple, exactly copying the generic situation. So let's extend it to BRST invariant uh, L fix plus ghost, namely by writing the gauge fixing plus ghost term as a total BRST transformation of something else. So we have to apply the BRST operator S onto something such that when we choose something uh, appropriate here, this construction leads on the one hand the gauge fixing term that we want plus something else and the something else will then be the necessary for the Pope of ghost interactions. And so here we simply can write uh, the anti-ghosts C bar I, let's say where I is summed over the four possibilities here times Xi I over two times bi um, plus fi. And if we evaluate this, let me just check, yeah. um, if we evaluate this, then we obtain on the one hand uh, quadratic terms for the b's. b's can be eliminated. And then we obtain from this construction L fix plus ghost is if the B's are eliminated gives the previous gauge fixing term plus a Fadiev Pope of ghost term. And the Fadiev Pope of ghost term has the form which uh, you obtain by acting with the BRST operator on the round bracket. So it gives minus the anti-ghosts C bar I times the BRST transformations of these FIs where the FIs are the ones that you want in the gauge fixing term. So, and here at this point in the lecture, we do not work out all the calculational details for this, but clearly this can be worked out because everything is completely fixed, everything is completely unambiguously determined by the definitions that we gave, and therefore uh, what you obtain from this is um, clear. It just needs to be calculated, and then you have certain Feynman rules for the fadiev popov ghosts which are necessary in the loops in order to make the physical S matrix unitary. And let me just give you some examples. What are some example terms? So from uh, evaluating this, for example, if we look at uh, the BRST transformation of this gauge fixing term involving the W plus, 
What do we obtain if we apply a BRST transformation onto such a term? The BRST transformation of a gauge boson is the covariant derivative of the Fadeev Popov ghost. So from this term, we on the one hand obtain d mu times the covariant derivative of a ghost, which is on the one hand the normal derivative of a ghost, d mu c plus times gauge coupling times structure constants times products of w's and ghosts. So let me just write proportional here such that you can see the structure. You get gauge coupling times a product of w bosons and for df pope of ghosts. And therefore plugging it into the Lagrangian um, Oh, sorry, and uh, so this was from the W boson and then from the Goldstone boson. We uh, know that the Goldstone bosons transform into uh, the ordinary Higgs field times for the F pop of ghost. So we get plus MW times zeta W times terms proportional to vacuum expectation value plus Higgs field also in this round bracket. Uh, outside of the round bracket. So this is, this is the BRST transformation structure of this term. And so therefore, if you look at the terms in this um, ghost Lagrangian, it contains the following terms. On the one hand, it contains anti-ghost times double derivative of a ghost, which is something like this, C bar d'Alembert C, which is a kinetic term for a FDF pop of ghost, and it comes with a minus sign such that it has the ordinary sign of a kinetic term for a scalar field, and that will uh, lead to a scalar field propagator for the FDF pop of ghosts. On the other hand, from this term here, you get plus um, a constant MW times zeta uh, times vacuum expectation value and uh, this in the end boils down to MW square times zeta times products of FDF Pope of ghosts. So this is like a mass term of the FDF Pope of ghosts and the mass is correlated with the mass of the actual gauge bosons up to the gauge fixing parameter zeta. So looking at these two terms, the FDF Popov ghosts act like scalar fields with a mass. And the mass is MW um, up to the factor zeta. Okay, and then there are interaction terms. So here you have a term of the anti-ghost multiplied with the ghost and the Higgs field. So this gives an interaction um, C bar Higgs field times the ghost multiplied with the W mass and with the appropriate zeta factor. So you have an interaction of the FDF Popov ghost with the Higgs field. And from here, you have an interaction of the FDF Popov ghost with the gauge field. Okay. So, and as I said, the prefactors are unambiguous, but we do not work them out now. At some point, I will give you uh, the Feynman rules in detailed form with all the prefactors. But here, I want you just to understand the structure and uh, to understand the mechanism where it comes from. So the comment is that the FDF Popov ghosts act like fermionic scalar fields. So they have the wrong statistics, scalar fields with a mass given by the corresponding psi or zeta times the appropriate W or Z boson mass square, depending on which ghost you're looking at. And there are interactions
of the following form. On the one hand, we have an interaction of the Higgs field with ghosts and anti-ghosts. And we have interactions between the W, uh, between all the gauge bosons, W, Z, and photon, and the FDF pope of ghosts. And the interaction strengths can be calculated. So in this way, you can obtain the full Feynman rules for the standard model in this RxI gauge fixing, which is the gauge fixing typically used in practical calculations, especially at the loop level. Any questions to this topic? Because that is the end of this section on gauge fixing and BRST invariants. Afterwards, we will start with a new topic. Are you able to calculate in detail all the prefactors? So the information is in principle there. It is just a matter of time. Not much time, but a little bit of time to plug in all the prefactors, including minus i from the generic BRST transformations, applying them to the standard model, and then you will get these interactions. And compared to QCD, the new thing is that the ghosts have a mass. The mass is correlated to the gauge boson masses, and they have interactions with the Higgs fields, precisely with those Higgs fields which have vacuum expectation values and which are relevant for the spontaneous symmetry breaking and for the generation of the W and Z boson masses. We also, a few hours ago, discussed the masses of the would-be Goldstone bosons, right? They also come from the gauge fixing. So this very same gauge fixing term contains mass terms also for the Goldstone bosons. And they are also correlated to the W and Z boson masses. And it would be a simple calculation to show that the Goldstone boson masses and the ghost masses are identical. They are the same. And that is actually necessary uh, in order to, um, for the final result for physical quantities to be independent of the gauge because these uh, masses generate poles in propagators and therefore uh, particular analytical contributions to Feynman diagrams. And the poles from the ghost propagators and from the Goldstone boson propagators are at the same position and therefore they have the chance of cancelling each other out such that the final result is independent of uh, these xi-dependent masses. So this is a structural feature and of course the equality of the Goldstone boson and ghost masses, all of them are unphysical and the equality follows from the BRST invariance of the theory. Good. Now let me check something here. Then let us go to the next topic. Custodial symmetry, a very physical and important topic for phenomenology of the standard model, and uh, in particular for current electroweak precision physics. Custodial symmetry is related to one of the miracles of the standard model that we have already observed. Namely, one such miracle was that in our notation, CW was equal to C theta. And let us remember what that means. CW for us is an abbreviation for the ratio of the W and Z boson masses. And on the other hand, uh, the cosine of the weak mixing angle theta W was defined via the gauge couplings, namely tangent of theta was defined as the ratio GY divided by GW. 
And this equality is valid at three level. And remember that we are working at three level at the moment in the standard model. So uh, this is an equality that comes out of the standard model calculations. We discussed it and we stressed that it is very important because experimentally this equality is approximately valid. It is approximately valid up to corrections of a few percent, which can in the standard model be attributed to loop corrections. But at three level, we have an exact equality here. And that is one of the miracles, uh, because it um, is not built into the definition of the standard model, but it comes out of it. And it uh, follows from the particular field content in the scalar sector, in other words, in the Higgs sector. The fact that the uh, electroweak symmetry is broken by a Higgs doublet instead of a Higgs triplet leads to this equation. But you have seen in the exercise but a, that a Higgs triplet would give rise to a completely different mass ratio. And so let us also um, relate this to a different quantity. There is the parameter rho 3, the three level rho parameter, which is exactly the ratio here. Uh, let's say mw divided by mz times cosine theta. And uh, defined in this way, the rho 3 parameter in the standard model is apparently 1. Okay. So you can formulate the same miracle by saying the three level rho parameter in the standard model is 1. And this whole section is about understanding and uh, illuminating the reason behind this. We want to identify a secret symmetry of the standard model, namely the so-called custodial symmetry, which is the origin of that relationship. And uh, identifying the symmetry makes you able to understand what happens if you change the standard model to physics beyond the standard model, depending on the properties of these beyond the standard model changes. Such a custodial symmetry either remains valid or it is unvalid. And therefore, different uh, ways to extend the standard model can either keep this relationship or completely ruin it. And that is important to understand. So that is what we want to do now. And let us begin with um, the consequence of the symmetry breaking pattern of the gauge invariance in the electroweak standard model, namely uh, the consequences of SU2 left cross U1 hypercharge is broken to U1 for electric charge. Let us assume the symmetry breaking pattern, which is, uh, of course, the definition of the electroweak symmetry breaking. And uh, let us use only this information and nothing else to see what follows from it. So let's look at a generic scalar sector. Uh, with fields phi i, or we call it small phi i plus v i, such that you already see that the scalar fields are some number of scalar fields, and they all might have some vacuum expectation values at three level. And we uh, consider gauge invariance under the gauge group SU2 left cross U1 hypercharge. And we assume that the vacuum is invariant under U1 electric charge, where electric charge is defined as T3 from the left-handed gauge group plus hypercharge. So that means if you act with T3 from left-handed plus hypercharge, if you act on this onto the vacuum, you get zero. This is the assumption. And now let us draw consequences from just this assumption and uh, using nothing else. The claim is that, um, OK, let's first say the question is, what are the consequences of this? 
and let's define again the mass matrix um, m square a b as we did in the generic discussion of generic gauge theories with spontaneous symmetry breaking. This was the mass matrix for the vector bosons in the theory and um, they are in general defined like this vi dagger times anti-commutator of g a t a comma g b t b i j v j where here we uh, use as an abbreviation, let's say the generator T4 is identified with hypercharge, just to make it simpler, because we have four generators, T1, T2, T3, four SU2, and hypercharge, and let's just call that T4. And let's also say G1, 2, 3, the gauge couplings, they are all identified with GW for the SU2 gauge group, and G4 is identified with GY for the hypercharge gauge group. Then we can simply write the generic mass matrix in the identical form to what we discussed in the generic case for the standard model um, or for any theory which has the gauge group SU2 left cross U1 hypercharge. And let us now in this notation evaluate the consequences of the for the mass matrix. And there is a very simple claim which I want to write down such that you will see better what we are aiming for. The claim is that the mass matrix has a certain structure. No matter uh, what the concrete theory is, if we have this starting point, then the mass matrix automatically has a particular block form, namely it consists of a two by two block here for the indices one and two. And this two by two block is actually proportional to the unit matrix. So here we have identical entries and here we have zeros. And the two identical entries we can call, let's say, let's call them G W square times V W square. And here the same G W square times Vw square. So this is proportional to the unit matrix. It is obviously also proportional to Gw square because clearly in the 1, 2 sector uh, all the generators are multiplied with Gw. So clearly in this sector Gw square will always appear. But the main point is here there are two zeros and here these two entries are equal. And so they can be written as Gw square times some prefector and let's call the prefector VW square. Then we have another block matrix. Here this block matrix is automatically zero and this block matrix is also automatically zero. And then we have a fourth block matrix and this fourth block matrix is not proportional to a unit matrix but it is a complicated matrix with determinant zero and uh, it can be written like this here gw square times a new constant time let's say vz square so clearly the 3 3 element again is multiplied with gw square so let's factor that out and then there is some proportionality constant which i call vz square and that can must doesn't have to be the same proportionality constant as here. But then we know the rest. If this is like that, then here we have minus GW, GY times the same VZ square. So only the gauge couplings are replaced in this form. And here we have the same minus GW, GY times VZ square. And here we have GY square times VZ square with a plus. And then you see that the determinant of this block matrix is automatically zero uh, because the two lines are proportional to each other. And uh, um, the uh, eigenvalues are on the one hand zero and the other eigenvalue is the combination of those two um, quantities here. So if this is the matrix, then we can immediately draw some conclusions, namely 
the W mass square from this uh, matrix would be equal to this GW square times the proportionality constant VW square. So that this unit matrix directly gives masses to the W plus minus bosons. And this block matrix gives mass to the photon, which is zero, and to the Z. And the Z mass square is the other eigenvalue uh, from this matrix. And this is uh, simply this op um, combination, GW square plus GY square times the proportionality constant VZ square. And then you can look at the row three parameter, row three defined again in this way, mw square divided by mz square times cosine theta square. Did I forget the square? Sorry about this. Please add a square here everywhere. This is the same thing squared. So here if we plug in the squares, then um, in the ratio, Indeed, the gauge couplings appear exactly in the form which is the one given by the cosine of the weak mixing angle. So the gauge couplings and the weak mixing angle drop out and the only thing that remains is the ratio between these proportionality constants Vw square and Vz square. So it can be anything. In general, the row three parameter could be any value between zero and infinity. And you see that the symmetry breaking pattern as u2 cross u1 goes to u1 hypercharge does not guarantee that the row parameter is any particular value. In particular, it doesn't lead to row equal one, but row could be anything. And uh, there, in this way, you see that the result in the standard model where rho is one is special and corresponds to one of those miracles. And so that is the claim and let us now prove the claim. Let us prove that the mass matrix, um, if you, we have the symmetry breaking pattern, leads to this block form. Let's do it here. So how can we prove this? We prove it by literally using the definitions. And what we can start with is that uh, Q, the electric charge acting on these vacuum expectation values that we have is zero, which is equivalent uh, that T3 plus hypercharge is zero, or in uh, this new notation, we can also say T3 acting on V is equal to minus T4 acting on V, where, as I said, T4 stands just as a different symbol for hypercharge. So T3 and T4 act in opposite ways onto the vacuum expectation value. Then, Look at the definition of the mass matrix squared. It is obtained by acting with the generators onto the vacuum. So what happens if you look at specifically mass matrix uh, with index, some index A, uh, let's say A, and then three, and compare it to the mass matrix square with some index four? if you compare the indices three and four. Then the thing with the index three is obtained by acting with T3 onto the vacuum. But you also have a factor uh, GW. So if we factor out one over GW, then this is just obtained by T3 acting on the vacuum. And if we, we factor out here a factor one over GY, then this is obtained by acting with T4 onto the vacuum. But there is this relationship, and therefore we see that uh, mass matrix third row with this normalization is minus to the fourth row with that normalization. And that immediately explains the entire two by two block in the lower right corner.
So we immediately obtained this two by two block, which is proportional to GW square minus GW, GY minus GW, GY and plus GY square times some proportionality constant. This completely immediately follows from that. Therefore, we have already established half of what we need. And of course, this relationship doesn't tell us anything about the proportionality constant, which is therefore uh, some unknown number, but it tells us about the structure of the prefectors in front of what we called Vz. Okay, so this is the first result. How can we prove the rest of the structure? The rest of the structure can be proved in this way. Let us start uh, using the following. Zero is equal to the following. Let's say vi decker, and then let's put down commutator of q times uh, ta tb v ij. And let's use here only a, b equal 1, 2, 3. So for the fourth, it's always uh, even easier than for the uh, first three components where we have the non-trivial SU2 commutation relations. So let's just stick to uh, a, b equal 1, 2, 3, and then we also do not have to care about the gauge couplings because they are always equal to gw and can be factored out. So why is that zero? Because the vacuum is annihilated by q, therefore, for one term of the commutator, Q acts on to the left, on to V decker, and gives zero for the other part of the commutator, Q acts on to the right, on to the vacuum, and also gives zero. So therefore, this is clearly zero. But now let us evaluate the commutator. Let us evaluate the commutator. Q is equal to T3 plus hypercharge. And here we only use T1, 2, 3, so therefore the hypercharge immediately commutes with those matrices and therefore in the commutator the hypercharge can be dropped. However, T3 cannot be dropped and uh, then we can evaluate the commutator in the following way. Uh, like in quantum mechanics, commutator with a product gives the sum of the two commutators. So we have on the one hand commutator of T3 with TA times TB plus TA times the commutator of T3 with TB. Okay. So we simply evaluate the double commutator in this way. And then this is still zero. And for concrete choices of A and B, this gives us relationships between the matrix elements. Let us look at one example. Let us look, for example, at A equal B equal 1. What tells us the equation if A and B are equal to 1? If A and B are equal to 1, then we get 0 is equal to the following, namely, what is it equal to? Vi decker times commutator of T3 with T1. What is it? Do we know it or is it unknown? T3, T1. Yeah, what is left? T3, T1 gives I times T2. And that is known because this is the SU2 algebra. So we have here I times T2 times T1. And here T1 plus T1 and T3 with T1 is again I times T2. Ij, Vj. Okay. Um, Zooming out, the i doesn't really matter because the whole thing is zero. And then what we have here is between v dagger and v, we have anti-commutator of t1 and t2.
That is exactly the definition of the matrix element with index 1, 2. So what does it mean? It means that we have proven the matrix element 1, 2 is 0. That is exactly our claim. So we have established this 0 here. What happens if you put here, for example, a equal 1 and b equal 2? 1, 2. What happens then? Just do it in your mind. a is 1 and b is 2. If a is 1 and b is 2, then we have here the same i t2 times t2, t2 square. And here we have t1. And here we have the commutator of t3 with t2 gives minus i times t1. So we will get here t2 square minus t1 square. t2 square minus t1 square is 0. That means we would get a equal 1, b equal 2 leads us to m square 1, 1 is equal to m square 2, 2. The two matrix elements are equal, which is exactly what I claimed here. And so on. I don't have to tell you what you have to do next in order to prove all the other zeros. If you do anything else, you will prove step by step that all the other matrix elements are zero. So similarly, you can completely establish the block structure. Okay. So in the main point was uh, using the commutation relations between the electric charge and all the other generators and, uh, um, and the fact that the vacuum is annihilated by the electric charge. So that alone suffices to prove this structure. And uh, so looking again at the result, we get one mass term for W plus minus. We have two charged gauge bosons, W plus and W minus, and they have the same mass, and that is compatible with U1 gauge invariance. So the W is charged under U1, and so we have two uh, uh, particle antiparticle degrees of freedom with equal mass. That corresponds to that two by two unit matrix, and on the other hand, we have a massless gauge boson corresponding to the unbroken electric charge gauge group. So that is also a must. And we have a fourth massive gauge boson, the Z, and its mass is here unrelated to all the other masses. That is what we get from the symmetry breaking pattern. So if there is such a special result, rho equal to 1, which doesn't follow from the symmetry, we should identify some other mechanism which is responsible for this striking result, which also happens to agree with experiment. And apparently, the gauge invariance is not the cause of this, so it must be something else. And people have searched for uh, the symmetry, which is responsible for uh, rho equal to 1. And the outcome is this custodial symmetry, which I want to explain now. But let me first check the camera. Let me immediately show you the final result of the analysis, namely the discovery of the true symmetry pattern, which can explain rho equal to 1 at three level. And uh, let me illustrate it and discuss it in outside of the standard model by only looking at symmetry patterns. And then afterwards, after explaining uh, the symmetry pattern, I will show you why and how the standard model actually has the symmetry that I am now going to explain. But let's first explain the symmetry. Let us uh, remember that so far we have looked at local gauge invariance of the standard model. 
but uh, there is also global gauge invariance. And of course, global gauge invariance is like a corollary of local gauge invariance if the standard model and the theory is invariant under local SU2 cross U1 gauge transformations. Of course, it is also invariant under global SU2 cross U1 gauge transformations. Global means X independent. However, it can be that uh, there is a global symmetry which is a bigger symmetry than the one which is the local symmetry. And let us consider this particular case as a possibility such that there is a bigger global symmetry group than uh, local gauge invariance. And then the picture is like this. Let me draw a big picture. So this corresponds to the symmetry group of our theory. Let's call it capital G. G would be the symmetry group under which the theory is invariant if you look only at global transformations. And then a subgroup of that, in general, a non-trivial subgroup might be uh, the one which corresponds to local gauge invariance, and let's call that H. So that is just a subgroup in general. So that corresponds to local gauge invariance. And then there can be spontaneous symmetry breaking so in the standard model, that would be SU2 cross U1. Uh, then there is spontaneous symmetry breaking, and uh, the spontaneous symmetry breaking can, of course, affect the full global symmetry group. And so there is a subgroup of that which is unbroken and a part of it which is broken. So what we can draw is the subgroup which corresponds to the spontaneously unbroken part. So let us call that... Uh, curly G. So this is a curly G. Corresponds to the unbroken by spontaneous symmetry breaking. And then there is of course some overlap, so some unbroken local gauge invariance, curly H. And so that is basically the intersection of the group which is locally gauge invariant and the unbroken by um, spontaneous symmetry breaking. So in the standard model, we only know that this group normal H is uh, SU2 cross U1 and the unbroken subgroup is U1 corresponding to electric charge. And now let us consider that there is actually behind it all a bigger symmetry group which contains that just as a subgroup. And let us assume the following structure. And in order to write down the structure, we actually neglect the hypercharge gauge coupling GY. So let us set for the following discussion the hypercharge gauge coupling GY to zero. And then we assume that the group capital G, the full global symmetry group, is bigger. Namely, it is the group SU2 left cross SU2 right. So it is a group with six generators instead of four, a six-dimensional Lie group instead of a four-dimensional Lie group. So this H is, of course, SU2 L cross U1 hypercharge, so that U1 hypercharge in this context would be like a subgroup of this SU2, right? And let us assume that the unbroken uh, global group, curly G, which is unbroken, is not only U1, but is actually SU2 custodial 
which is the diagonal subgroup of the SU2 left cross SU2 right. So here, there is the word custodial appearing for the first time. This is the custodial group and its generators are, I say the diagonal subgroup, what that means in terms of generators is that we have TL corresponding to the left-handed SU2 plus TA R corresponding to the right-handed SU2. So these are three generators, three generators, this SU2 left and the SU2 right, they are independent SU2 groups, so that means that the right-handed and the left-handed generators, they completely commute between th these two groups, left-right. But the sum of the two is again uh, an object which satisfies the original SU2 commutation relations. Therefore, this sum generates a new SU2 group, which is the diagonal subgroup of SU2 left cross SU2 right. This will become probably also a little bit more clear by looking at the examples, but this is the completely general definition. And in uh, the standard model, the local um, group curly H it's, is uh, electric charge that would correspond to just a one-dimensional U1 Lie group with one generator and that would correspond to just T3 left plus T3 right. But we now assume that there is a um, deeper, bigger symmetry uh, even in the vacuum. We have a three-dimensional Lie group which leaves the vacuum invariant. And that is the so-called custodial symmetry. So it is a global symmetry of the vacuum of the theory. Okay, let us assume this structure and let us now go back to the mass matrix and uh, calculate what is now the consequence of this assumed symmetry structure on the same mass matrix. So what is the consequence for the mass matrix M square AB? And let's only look at A and B equal to 1, 2, 3. Since for the discussion we neglect the hypercharge gauge coupling, therefore clearly uh, the fourth row and fourth column in this approximation would be zero. So the only non-trivial thing that we need to look at is this 3-3 three, three matrix element, which so far was unrelated to the other two matrix elements, and now there will be a relationship. So let's derive this relationship. So now we have zero is equal, or, yeah, so let's say zero is equal to um, TA left plus T A right acting on the vacuum. So the vacuum is left invariant under all these generators for all A. Right, because that was our assumption. On the other hand, the mass matrix is composed only of the left-handed generators because they are the ones corresponding to the gauge group and uh, the ones corresponding to the gauge boson masses. So the M square AB is just given as always B dagger I times this case GW square times anti-commutator T left A with T left B acting on VJ. So T left because T left corresponds to the actual gauge interactions and to the gauge boson masses. So we see here this um, difference. The vacuum is left invariant under some combination of left and right-handed generators. The mass matrix is composed only of the left-handed generators. Now we can use the first equation in the second, and then we can again get zero is equal to something similar to what we did before. B I decker, and then let's look at the commutator T A left plus T R A um, commutator with let's say T left A uh, T left B T left C 
or EJ, VJ. So that is zero because this combination of generators leaves the vacuum invariant. And here I write the two generators which we need to construct the mass matrix. So now in this construction, TR has nothing to do with TL. TR completely commutes with TL. Therefore, in this commutation relation, it can be dropped. So this can be dropped because it anyway commutes with the left-handed generators. And then what remains is this TLA, comma, TBL, TCL acting on VJ. And then we can go on just as we did before, only that our mass matrix previously was only invariant if we have here the electric charge Q. So we get one, uh, we got one uh, condition from that. And now we have three conditions because the mass matrix is, is invariant under whatever generator we put here, T1, T2, T3. So that means the three by three part of the mass matrix is completely invariant under the full uh, SU2 left. That is what this means. So the three by three part of M square AB is fully SU2 left invariant. And if a three by three matrix is fully invariant under this, then it means it must be proportional to the unit matrix. So in particular, that means m square 1, 1 is equal to m square 2, 2. And that is also equal to m square 3, 3. And this last equation is new. So we get from this that this block here, this 3 by 3 block, must be a unit matrix because it is invariant under the full SU2 left. Um, transformations. And that in this notation means the VW and VZ are equal proportionality constants. So let's write down the consequence for the mass matrix in a nice form. M square AB, now including the hypercharge, has the following structure. The same as this, only that VW is equal to VZ. So we have here GW square, VW square, GW square, v, VW square, GW square, VW square, all the same. And then here we have the, the other block, which we already know from just U1 invariants, minus GW, GY, VW square, and here the same, minus GW, GY and here plus GY square VW square. And so to highlight it, this equality of the three entries, this is new and corresponds to custodial symmetry. So we have a full SU2 invariance of the first three by three block of the mass matrix. And on the other hand, the fact that we have here the yellow two by two block followed just from U1 invariance of the vacuum. And if we combine both pieces of information, then we have here a correlation, namely this block gives us the set mass, and the set mass is now proportional to the same VW as the W boson mass. So therefore, in this context where we have this custodial symmetry of the vacuum, we get row three automatically at three level is equal to one.
Okay. So this is this new custodial symmetry, which corresponds to this bigger symmetry pattern. So any questions to the derivation? Yes, so uh, for any A, uh, this is, so you, you have the same A here and here, but then you can choose any A and you have three different generators and all of them leave the vacuum invariant. That is the point. So each of those combinations leaves the vacuum invariant. And there are three of them and uh, all of them can be used here. And then this is this tricky uh, thing the vacuum stays invariant if you look at the combination left right. But uh, if you go to the consequence for the mass matrix, the right handed part drops out entirely. And what simply is important now is that the vacuum uh, and the mass matrix is invariant under this left handed SU2. And the left handed SU2 means that you have now this three by three matrix, which is invariant under any SU2 transformation, and therefore it must be the unit matrix up to a factor. Or I mean, you can uh, look at, you can uh, do all the calculations in detail. You don't have to say it in words, it leaves the matrix invariant. Plug in all possible combinations of indices, and then you will see that uh, after a while, these ma matrix elements must be equal in a way similar to what we did before. So uh, if you plug in here T1, A equal one, and here two, three, then you will get a relationship that uh, the matrix element two, two will be equal to the matrix element three, three, which gives you the desired relationship. And again, you can compare this to the previous case. In the previous case, we basically had, instead of this, we had the electric charge Q, which was T3 plus Y. And then again, Y would drop out of the equation because it commutes with everything, just like TR. But here remains only T3. And from the T3, we get only a subset of the relationships. And now we have T1, T2, and T3. And therefore, we get the more powerful consequence. And of course, you might at the moment, you might not have an intuition for what the TR actually is, because that uh, has now been completely newly invented. And what it means in the standard model will come next. But uh, the point is, and maybe that is a historical remark, the entire discussion came up not immediately in the standard model, but in um, ways to extend the standard model where it was observed that some extensions uh, destroy the row parameter equality and other extensions do not destroy the row parameter equality. And then people started to investigate what is the cause of this and how can we uh, construct uh, extensions of the standard model which automatically um, in a guaranteed way lead to row equal one. And in this way one um, uh, observed and understood this particular symmetry breaking pattern. And so this was in particular um, first observed in the context of so-called technicolor models. For electroweak symmetry breaking where you assume that the Higgs sector is not an elementary scalar field, but a much more complicated Higgs sector, which comes from non-perturbative non effects. Um, and then uh, if these non-perturbative effects um, follow such a symmetry pattern, then automatically, no matter whether you understand the details of non-perturbative dynamics or not, you know that they lead to rho equal one, which was very important to know. Okay, yeah. From this point on, we were just looking at Custodos um, transformation of, of this group. 
I wouldn't say only, but what do you mean by only? Well, um, no. So, <laughs> uh, I don't know what you have in mind exactly, but if you, um, in the standard model, we will now make this explicit, because in the standard model, this pattern is realized, and I will show you how and why. And uh, then you understand it, hopefully, and uh, since you understand it in the future afterwards, we can discuss, uh, go back to the ordinary discussions of the standard model, and you can keep this in the back of your mind. Uh, if that answers your question. But on the other hand, if you want to extend the standard model and study physics beyond it, like Technicolor, Supersymmetry, or some other extensions of the standard model, like Higgs triplet, Higgs singlet extensions, then you should uh, also keep in mind this symmetry breaking structure. And you should at least know whether your favorite extension has such a symmetry or not. You are not obliged to only consider extensions which have this custodial symmetry. It is fair enough to consider extensions which do not have this symmetry breaking, but then you should know uh, very acutely that your row can be anything, and you should make sure in another way that it doesn't violate experimental results. Okay. Let us now look at the standard model. And for this, let us consider the case where the hypercharge gauge coupling is actually zero and uh, at where in the Yukawa sector, the up quark Yukawa coupling is equal to the down quark Yukawa coupling, and we ignore the leptons. Which is, of course, not really possible because of the gauge anomalies that we discussed the last time. But uh, anyway, let us ignore them, or otherwise set the Yukawa coupling of the leptons to zero. Such that they do not interact with the Higgs. In this approximation, which is really an approximation to the standard model, the standard model uh, develops this additional custodial symmetry. And uh, before electroweak symmetry breaking, it develops this bigger global symmetry group corresponding to SU2 left cross SU2 R. And you see from this that ultimately the symmetry is actually broken, not spontaneously broken, but it is broken by the fact that the hypercharge gauge coupling is non-zero and by the fact that the up and down Yukawa couplings are not equal. So these things break the custodial symmetry explicitly and uh, we will discuss at the end what that means. But let's first do this approximation, which is a numerical approximation to the standard model, and then discuss this symmetry. So let us write capital QL for the left-handed quarks, as we always did, UL DL for the left-handed doublet. But let us also write a right-handed quark doublet, UR, DR, which we have not done before because uh, the UR and DR, they are individually singlets under SU2, right? But let us now write them as a doublet called QR, a right-handed doublet. And let us also write the Higgs fields as this, uh, this sort of curly H, let us write the Higgs field in this way. How do we write it? Um, phi tilde, comma, phi, where phi tilde is this uh, SU2 transformation with the epsilon tensor 
So phi tilde i is equal to epsilon i j phi dagger j. So this is this object which we need in the top quark Yukawa coupling, if you remember, right? We needed this, uh, we called it baryon-like uh, SU2 combination where we connect two doublets with an epsilon tensor. And here we first introduce simply uh, such an epsilon transformed uh, doublet, which is just another doublet um, according to our discussion from before. So if this is an SU2 doublet, then this is also an SU2L doublet, given our discussion from before when we looked at the top core Kyukawa coupling. So what that means is uh, that we are now right uh, next to each other the two doublets, so we get a two by two matrix and the matrix entries are on the right, first of all, the matrix entries for the actual normal Higgs doublet. So let's call it uh, phi plus and phi zero. And here on the left column, we have the following, namely because of the epsilon tensor, we have here phi zero dagger and here minus phi plus dagger. So we write the Higgs field in this matrix form. Then let's look at some connections. What happens if you do H dagger H in terms of this matrix and take the trace? If you take the trace of this, then first H dagger H gives you a row times column. So H dagger H contains on the one hand the column and the row phi dagger times phi the whole doublet dagger times itself. And it also contains phi tilde dagger times phi tilde. But phi tilde dagger times phi tilde is the same as the original phi. And so from here we get the sum of the diagonal elements. And this is just phi dagger times phi plus phi tilde dagger times phi tilde. But that is the same as two times phi dagger times phi. So this is an SU2 invariant combination. So this is uh, something that we know which appears in our standard model Lagrangian. And uh, in terms of the new curly H notation, we can write this as one half of the trace of uh, the matrix H dagger H. And so in this way, let's also remind ourselves of the Yukawa couplings. Uh, the Yukawa couplings contained the top quark Yukawa coupling times QL bar times phi tilde. This is exactly this phi tilde times QR plus YD times QL bar times the ordinary phi times DR plus the leptons, which we ignore. Okay, so this was our um, Lagrangian for the Yukawa couplings involving the phi tilde and the phi. And we discussed that this is gauge invariant in because of the epsilon tensor. And now, having all this notation at hand, we can write the full standard model Lagrangian in a slightly different way, namely L standard model can now be written as follows. Namely, we have the kinetic terms for the left-handed quarks, I d slash times q left, so q left bar q left, and a covariant derivative in between. And then we have a covariant derivative for u r and for u oh, and for d r, but there is no problem in combining them in such a vector notation q r um, bar times i d slash times QR. So then we have summarized the two terms for the right-handed quark singlets just by using the new notation. Then there is the Higgs potential term and the Higgs potential depends only on phi dagger phi. That can now be written in terms of the trace. So we have minus one half mu square times trace 
of h dagger h. And we have the lambda term minus lambda over 4 times the same trace squared. So I think we had here lambda over 2 and here 1 half in the square. That is our Higgs potential written uh, with a matrix valued Higgs field. And then we can also write our Yukawa Lagrangian. Our Yukawa Lagrangian now can be um, written in this way. If the Yukawa couplings are equal, then the two terms can be combined and they just look like this. Why? Let's say we call the common Yukawa coupling, we call just Y, then we have here Y times QL bar times the matrix valued Higgs field H times uh, the right-handed quark doublet QR. And then by evaluating it, you get exactly that the down type part, which is the lower component, gets multiplied with the original phi and QL, and the up type part gets multiplied with phi tilde and QL. So this summarizes both Yukawa interactions. And then we have also the kinetic terms for the gauge fields which we do not have to rewrite. But here you see um, two things, or three. First of all, you can combine the right-handed quarks to something like a right-handed doublet. This doesn't transform under gauge transformations in a doublet sort of way, but nevertheless, we can write it like a doublet. The Higgs can be written as a two-by-two two matrix, and the Yukawa couplings can be neatly compactified to one expression if the Yukawa couplings happen to be equal. And then it connects a left-handed doublet, a right-handed doublet, and a Higgs mass matrix. And the Higgs potential also can be written such that it only depends on this matrix. And now, the additional symmetry of the standard model becomes manifest. Namely, what is now the global symmetry, in other words, non-gauged, non-local symmetry, is the following. Namely, we can transform QL, the left-handed quark doublet, with a UL two by two matrix. UL is element of SU2L. So this is an SU2 matrix. Then QR goes to UR times QR, where UR is another SU2 matrix. So it's an element of an independent SU2R group. So there are two completely different and completely independent two by two matrices, both uh, SU2 um, kind of matrices. Then we transform this, and then we immediately see that this kinetic term is invariant under this um, two by two matrix because u dagger u drops out. This is also invariant, um, even though that has nothing to do with gauge transformations, but because this ur matrix is global x independent, the derivative doesn't do anything, and we simply get again ur dagger times ur drops out. So this kinetic term is also invariant. And then we can define the Higgs field matrix transforms like as follows, namely, how does it transform? From the left with UL and from the right with UR dagger. So it transforms from the left and from the right with two different matrices. And then uh, you see what happens with the trace to, uh, H dagger H, in H dagger H, you obtain immediately UL dagger times UL drops out. And then uh, what remains here is UR and UR dagger on the left and right, but because of the trace, UR and UR dagger also drop out. So this trace is invariant under this um, transformation, even if you have two completely independent SU2 matrices. So the second line is also invariant because here and here the same trace appears. And now how about the Yukawa coupling? 
the Yukawa coupling is also invariant under this beautiful new transformation. So UL, uh, QL transforms here with UL Decker, and H transforms with UL, so UL drops out. Then we get here UR Decker times UR also drops out. So the Yukawa coupling is also invariant under this transformation here. So, and uh, maybe let me add also the transformation of the gauge bosons. So that can be written in this way. TA times WA mu under global gauge transformations, that simply transforms um, uh, in, in a similar way as the Higgs field matrix. So that is a two by two matrix and that transforms from the left with UL and from the right with UL dagger. So TA, WA, mu. That is something that appears inside of the covariant derivative of the left-handed quark doublet. There appears exactly this combination, and this combination behaves like this, where UL is an X-independent SU2 matrix. So under global gauge transformations, the gauge trans bosons simply transform in a linear way like matter fields. Okay, and then, uh, as I said, the Lagrangian is invariant. And this uh, symmetry um, has two independent SU2 transformations and therefore the symmetry group is SU2 left times SU2 right. So we see that our theory, the standard model before a symmetry breaking, has exactly this global symmetry group SU2 left cross SU2 right as it was assumed for this custodial symmetry structure. So that is now made manifest. And uh, again, it was made manifest by combining the right-handed singlets into a right-handed doublet, a very natural thing to do, and then transforming the doublet under such a right-handed uh, SU2. And uh, uh, the, for the Higgs field, we do this matrix transformation. Okay. Now, how about the vacuum? How about the battery? Okay. So, how about the vacuum? So, in this matrix form, the Higgs uh, in the vacuum has the following structure, namely the phi tilde, so the neutral components become V over square root of two, so this matrix becomes this one. And what do you see? This matrix is proportional to the unit matrix times a proportionality constant V over square root of two. And uh, this matrix uh, under this SU2 cross SU2 transforms with UL from the left and UR dagger from the right. So you see that it is invariant under special SU2 cross SU2 transformations, namely if the two are equal. If UL is equal to U right. So if the two matrices are equal and uh, then H vacuum goes into UL times H vacuum times UL dagger, the same. And since this is proportional to the unit matrix, the two matrices drop out and that is equal to the vacuum itself. So the vacuum is invariant under a full SU2 symmetry group namely you have here a full SU2 at your disposal, but the SU2 transformations that you need to choose are the diagonal subgroup of the original SU2 left cross SU2 right in this sense. So in words, this corresponds to the diagonal subgroup. And the name would be SU2 custodial, SU2C, is equal 
to the SU2 left uh, equal to right, let's say. And the corresponding generators are TA left plus TA right. And that is exactly the symmetry structure that we had to assume. So this is in line with the general discussion. Okay, so let us just end the discussion by saying something about violations of uh, this custodial symmetry. In the standard model, there are violations of custodial symmetry. Namely, um, in the vacuum, we have the symmetry under the assumption that the hypercharge coupling is neglected and under the assumption that the Yukawa couplings for up and down sectors are equal. And of course they are not equal. So in the standard model, GY is actually non-zero and the hypercharges, uh, the Yukawa couplings of up and down are non-zero. And so this is a violation of the custodial symmetry in particular for the Yukawa couplings, you see immediately that there is no way that you can write down this term in this simple form. And actually, if you look at three generations, then uh, you have the top quark uh, compared to the bottom quark. And uh, here the Yukawa couplings are not only completely different, but also numerically very sizable. So this uh, difference between top and bottom Yukawa couplings is a very, very strong breaking of custodial symmetry. And that is a weaker breaking. The point is, however, that if you calculate at three level, then uh, both effects do not matter because you see that uh, the general structure of this, um, even with neglected Yukawa coupling, is sufficient to guarantee this three by three part of the mass matrix, which we had here. So the three entries are equal. That follows from this discussion. And that uh, consequence is not lost even for non-zero hypercharge. And at three level, the Yukawa couplings do not play any role at all in the calculation of the gauge boson mass matrices. Therefore, both breakings do not disturb the three level discussion. And that means uh, these breakings can only enter via loop corrections at a higher order level. At higher orders. And for example, there is then delta rho at the one loop level from the top and bottom sector, which is the biggest effect uh, as you can understand from this symmetry discussion, and that is about 1% order of magnitude. 
And so then you can now understand how it can happen that at tree level you have exact equalities between all these different mixing angles, but via loops in particular from here you get percent level corrections and those percent level corrections are then exactly the ones that you need in order to get really agreement between standard model theory and experiment because in experiment one observes percent level differences between all those different quantities that we defined. So that is very nice and uh, so if you do the calculations then the results from this agree actually very well with experimental data. So um, that um, is one thing, so in the standard model you get uh, violations at higher orders from both effects. So this also gives rise to loop corrections which are smaller than percent level. And what happens now in uh, physics beyond the standard model? In physics beyond the standard model you also have of course gy unequal to zero and you also have y top unequal to y bottom. Um, that is of course clearly the case as well, but in addition you might have additional particles which like top and bottom additionally break custodial symmetry. So you might have possibly additional terms in L which um, similar to top bottom which break the custodial symmetry. and uh, also breaking initially this SU2 left cross SU2 R. So for example in supersymmetry you can easily understand that if you have super partners to all the fields then there are super partners like stops and spottoms. They would similarly break uh, the SU2 right just like the ordinary top and uh, bottom. And so uh, then you have additional sources of custodial symmetry violation. And The second possibility is that you have a new tree level breakings of SU2C by rho 3 not equal to 1. And that for example happens if we have a Higgs triplet. As we discussed in the exercise, Higgs triplets give immediately rise to row 3 unequal to 1. And uh, that is of course a direct breaking of this custodial symmetry and it is phenomenologically important. So therefore you now understand what you need to make sure in extensions of the standard model. Namely, experiment agrees well with the standard model in this sector that we are talking about. Therefore, um, the breaking of custodial symmetry in the standard model coming from these effects is non-zero but exactly enough to basically guarantee agreement uh, to, with experiment. So changes of the standard model should not ruin this structure. Therefore, row 3 unequal to 1 must be very small. So Higgs triplets, if they exist, must have a very small vacuum expectation value which is a constraint on them. Models with many additional new fields and particles and new interactions must make sure that the additional breaking of custodial symmetry must not be too large in order to ruin agreement with experimental data. On the other hand, if there are experiments like the one recently where the W mass is now very much away from the standard model prediction, so the CTF measurement from last year has a W mass which is eight sigma higher than the prediction of the standard model, then you know what you have to do in order to get agreement with experiment. For example, introduce a Higgs triplet with a suitably chosen vacuum expectation value such that it brings you into agreement with experimental data or introduce Susie particles or something else which break custodial symmetry in an additional way. 
Okay, so this ends our discussion of custodial symmetry and the three-level row parameter and one of these additional miracles of the standard model. And in the afternoon, we will um, continue with uh, three generations of the standard model and discuss the CKM matrix. Okay, good. So see you then.